everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we're going to be talking about the case of Shelley Morgan. She was a mother of two who lived in the southwest of England and she just mysteriously disappeared one day in mid-1984. When a missing persons report was filed to the police, they began trying to pinpoint Shelley's movements on the day that she vanished. However, this did prove difficult for them to do and months went by with no sign of Shelley and no explanation as to what had happened to her. But eventually, the tragic news broke that Shelley's body had been found and what was a missing persons investigation now turned into a murder inquiry. A murder inquiry which sadly to this day is still open. Nearly four decades later, Shelley's case remains unsolved. So as always with the unsolved cases that I cover, I will leave some contact details to authorities linked down below in the description box in case anyone watching this video has any information about this horrific crime. But before we get into the case, I just thought I would quickly mention that I have started posting YouTube YouTube shorts if any of you guys are interested and wanted to check them out. If you go to my channel there is a shorts button right next to the videos button which will take you to them. They're kind of like little snippets or trailers almost for my full length true crime videos. Obviously with shorts you can only record for 60 seconds so I've been trying my best to make them as kind of informative and gripping as I can. And actually this is a nice little segue into today's sponsor because they have been helping me with this. So a huge thank you to Skillshare for partnering with me on today's video. Skillshare is an online learning community with literally thousands and thousands of online classes and members. Skillshare is a place to get inspired, spark creativity and learn new skills and there is such a huge variety of classes covering a huge variety of interesting topics. For example, they have classes about illustration and animation, creative writing, graphic design, film film and video, music, lifestyle, productivity, marketing, honestly the list goes on and on. So whether you want to fall back into an old hobby or develop a new skill completely, there will be something on Skillshare for you regardless of your skill level. The reason that I love Skillshare's approach to teaching is because members can learn at their own pace. Each class is broken down into several different lessons which is so helpful for me because I would say that on average they are under like 10 minutes long eat. So even if I've got a super busy day, I can still find the time to squeeze in a lesson and keep up with my course. And as I briefly mentioned, I'm currently using Skillshare to help me make my YouTube shorts. And the class I've been taking is how to make YouTube shorts, gain subscribers and grow your channel by Christopher Berry. And I'm finding it really, really useful and informative so far because it's not just about how to make the shorts, but also how to make them stand out and how to make them engage Aging. So I really really recommend that class for anyone else who is interested in making YouTube shorts But as I said, there are so many other classes on Skillshare for you to check out and I'm sure that you will find something that interests you So if you would like to check out Skillshare then head to the link in the description box because the first 1,000 people to use that link will receive a one month free trial of Skillshare Thank you once again to Skillshare for kindly sponsoring this section of the video and supporting the channel Thank you to you guys guys for supporting the sponsors on this channel and now let's just get into the case. But just before we continue, please listen carefully to the following. This video is about the murder of a young woman and it involves heavy themes such as violence towards women and sexual assault. Viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case, we are going back more than 39 years now to the summer of 1984 in Bristol, which is a city in the southwest of England. However, Bristol is is not where Shelley's story begins because she was actually from the US. She was born in 1951 in the state of Iowa and I believe Shelley was one of two children, the oldest of two children. She had a younger sister named Holly and I couldn't find any other information online about other siblings so I believe it was just her and Holly and obviously their mother and father too. They were a family of four. Sources state that Shelley was always a very smart young girl growing up 
apparently she actually started learning to talk much earlier than most other kids, much earlier than the average, so she was clearly very intelligent and a bit of a chatterbox. She was also a very keen reader, she loved to read books, she loved music, she always did really well in school. She was described as being a very talented girl all round really, but the thing that she was the absolute best at was art. Shelley was a very, very creative individual. It was clear to her parents from a very young age that she had a real talent for art and design, which she seemed to inherit from her father because he himself was actually an art teacher. Shelley was just very good with her hands. She was good at making sculptures and drawing and painting and she eventually learned a lot about textiles and how to sew. In fact, she got so good at textiles that she even began making her own clothes and her own like little stuffed teddy bears and dolls too. And in high school, she even started making clothes and costumes for her school's theatre department. In addition to that, Shelley was also a very keen traveller. She had dreams of travelling and exploring the world and when she was 17 years old, she got into this foreign exchange student programme and she got to go and stay with a family over in Japan for the summer. And this was her first ever trip overseas, so I can imagine that it was very exciting for her. And I'm sure that it came to no surprise to her friends and family when Shelley decided to pursue a career in the art and textiles industry. Specifically, she decided that she really wanted to kind of go down the route of costume making and costume design. And so in her later teenage years, she went off to university to get the relevant qualifications that she needed. She got a degree in theatre arts. Once she had finished her second year of uni, Shelley went on to travel some more and she got herself a summer internship at an opera house in Rome. I'm guessing she would help to design and create the outfits for the performers there. And it was while she was doing this internship when Shelley started looking around for other work in other countries in Europe, in particular in England. Apparently she had always wanted to move to England and in 1972 when Shelley was around 20, 21 years old, that dream became a reality because she secured a new job in the city of Liverpool. She got a job working in the Liverpool Playhouse as a wardrobe manager, which from what I can gather, she absolutely loved. She loved her new job and she loved living in the UK. But it wasn't just her career life that was very exciting and positive for her at this time because it was a few years after she started working in the Liverpool Playhouse when she met the man that she would go on to marry. She met a guy named Nigel Morgan. They started dating, they quickly fell in love and yeah, as I said, eventually they became husband and wife and they decided to start a family together. Shelley fell pregnant and gave birth to their first child, a little baby boy who they named Liam. And it was following Liam's birth when Shelley and Nigel decided that they were going to move from Liverpool to a house located within a little village in South Wales, which I believe is where Nigel was from originally. He was from South Wales. Eventually the couple went on to have a second child, this time a little girl who they called Charlotte and Charlotte seemed to really complete their family. They were now a happy little family of four and I think that they intended to remain in South Wales. They were going to raise their kids there. They had made a lot of friends in the local community and they were happy living there. However, upon learning that their son Liam was autistic, Shelley and Nigel actually made the decision to relocate to the city of Bristol because they felt that in Bristol there would be more kind of specialist education and support services for children like Liam than there would be in their small village in South Wales. They wanted Liam to have all of the support that he would need and so yeah they packed up their belongings and the Morgan family moved to Bristol. Specifically they moved into a house on Dunkerry Road in the Bedminster area of Bristol. Well I say all four of them moved, from what I can gather Shelley actually moved with her kids Liam and Charlotte initially without her husband Nigel. You see, the plan was for Nigel to stay in South Wales for a short period of time and kind of do up and renovate their house there so that they could then go on to sell it. So whilst he was busy doing that, Shelley and the kids got set up in Bristol with the hope that Nigel would be able to join them soon. Liam and Charlotte started at new schools in Bristol and Shelley decided that she wanted to get back into her work in the art and design industry. I think the last couple of years had seen her career kind of take a back seat 
whilst her kids were very young. But now that they were both in school and now that they had started to settle in Bristol, Shelley decided that she wanted to start doing the thing that she loved again. So she started taking art classes at the Bristol Polytechnic Art College and she started selling a lot of her artwork and being commissioned for pieces of art. In fact, shortly before this case took place, she had created and sold two paintings to an art dealer. They had asked her to paint these views in Bristol and I mean how incredible are these? These just show you how bloody talented she was as an artist. And she was also in the process of creating another painting. She had been asked if she could do a painting of the Clifton Suspension Bridge. So she was busy working at that. All in all, Shelley Morgan was just a very nice, happy woman who had a lot to look forward to in life. She had her career that she was excited to jump back into. She was living in a new city with her kids, looking forward to watching them grow up. She just had a lot in general to look forward to the rest of her life ahead of her. However, the future was something that Shelley would never get to see because in mid-1984, when she was just 33 years old, Shelley Morgan just suddenly disappeared. It was the 11th of June 1984, a day that began just as any other for Shelley and her kids. It was a Monday, so a school day for Liam and Charlotte, and so Shelley got the kids ready, and then at around 8.30am, she walked the kids to their bus stops and waved goodbye as they headed off for school. And whilst they were at school, Shelley had decided that she was going to have a productive day, taking some pictures with her camera, and also drawing some sketches of some scenic spots in Bristol. Specifically, sources state that she intended to head to the Lay Woods area, a nature reserve, to take some pictures. And she was also planning to photograph the Clifton Suspension Bridge too, due to being asked for that painting of the bridge. Now, Shelley's exact movements on this day are not known. We don't know, and the police don't know for certain, exactly where she went. However, we do know that for some reason, Shelley failed to collect her children from the bus stop later that day, later that afternoon. She just never turned up to the bus stop. Liam and Charlotte were waiting for their mum, but she never arrived. And when they walked back to their house alone, they couldn't get inside because the front door was locked. So it seemed as though their mum wasn't home yet. Thankfully, one of the neighbours kindly offered to let the kids come and wait inside of their home. And I'm sure that everyone was just assuming that Shelley was just running late. She probably just lost track of time while she was out taking her pictures and doing her sketches and she'd turn up any minute now. However, it seemed as though they were wrong because Shelley never did turn up. She never returned home. And so at around half seven that same evening, the police were contacted and Shelley was reported as missing. The Avon and Somerset police jumped into action upon receiving this report and they immediately began trying to establish Shelley's movements on the day that she vanished. Although, as I briefly mentioned, this did prove difficult for them to do. They couldn't be 100% certain on her last step because obviously she was on her own that day after dropping her kids off at school. And remember, this was 1984, so most places and areas didn't really have CCTV cameras or surveillance, so they couldn't track her through that. The police did appeal to the public for information and following this appeal, they did receive some reported sightings of Shelley from that day. According to one source, there was a woman who came forward saying that she believed that she had seen a woman matching Shelley's description at around 10 past 10 on the morning of the 11th of June, getting onto a bus. And this woman felt pretty certain that it was Shelley from the appeals because apparently this woman that she had seen was wearing these unique and distinctive red framed glasses and Shelley did wear red framed glasses. So anyway, this woman told the police that she saw Shelley or a woman matching Shelley's description getting on a bus which headed to the centre of Bristol near the Bristol bus station. And so from here, the police theorised that perhaps Shelley got on another bus at the bus station, which took her to an area close to the Clifton Suspension Bridge, as we know that she intended to take some photos of the bridge that day. However, this theory could not be confirmed. They couldn't confirm whether or not she had been to the bus station that day. The police also theorised that Shelley may have gotten on another bus, the 359, at some point, because this bus would have taken her to an area called 
Avon Gorge in Bristol, which is close to the Laywood Nature Reserve, where again, she intended to take some pictures. And although this also couldn't be 100% confirmed, there was apparently another witness who came forward and said that they saw a woman who, again, matched Shelley's description, talking to someone in a blue van near the entrance to the Ashton Court estate in Bristol, which is also very close to the Avon Gorge area, literally only like a mile and a half away. In addition to this, there was another reported sighting which put Shelley around the Backwell Hill area of Bristol that day. One member of the public came forward saying that they believed they had seen her, seen Shelley in a yellow truck or a yellow lorry on the Backwell Hill Road. There was another possible sighting of her in a BMW car which was parked on a road headed to Portishead. Portishead is a town in North Somerset. Apparently this car was parked on the Bristol to Portishead Road. There were a good few potential sightings of Shelley from different areas across Bristol. There was even a sighting that came in from a member of the public who said that they believed they had seen Shelley getting onto a ferry, boarding a ferry in Weymouth, but unfortunately none of these sightings could really be confirmed. So again, the police could not make an exact timeline. They couldn't establish exactly where she had gone that day, and so it was hard to know where to search, which areas of Bristol to focus on. But as part of their search, more than 80 police officers were drafted in to help look for Shelley, and 200 missing posters with Shelley's name and face on were created and distributed all across Bristol and around the northeast areas of Somerset. However, despite their efforts, the police weren't really getting anywhere. They had absolutely no idea what happened to Shelley on the day that she disappeared. It was honestly as if she had just vanished into thin air, and I really cannot even begin to imagine how difficult this time must have been for her family. Just as a quick side note, because some of you may be wondering whether or not Shelley's husband, Nigel, was looked at as a potential suspect in Shelley's disappearance, but of course it was established that he couldn't have been involved because he was in South Wales at the time as he was still renovating their old home. But yeah, it must have been absolute hell for her family, for her husband and children especially. Not having a clue where Shelley was or if they would ever see her again, not knowing if she was dead or if she was still alive and out there somewhere and possibly in danger. They just had no answers or at least that was until late September of 1984. So more than three months after Shelley vanished when a new potential lead suddenly emerged in the case following an anonymous phone call that came in to the police headquarters. It was the evening of the 24th of September when the following call was made to the police. I will play the recording for you now. I got some very important information about the missing woman from Windmill Hill. Unfortunately, this is going to turn out to be a murder inquiry. The body is in a Wall Street grave. I'm not certain whereabouts to. It's in a uh, it's in Hannam River between the bottom of Conham Hill and the old so that was the phone call that the police received and as I'm sure many of you will be able to tell from that recording, the man on this phone call had a very strong Bristolian accent so it's clear that he was a local and as I understand it the police weren't able to trace the call unfortunately and the man didn't give over his name and I don't believe the caller has ever been identified but of course he told the police that the body, Shelley's body, was in Hannam River in Bristol and so so obviously the police immediately set out to search this river for any trace of her. Dive teams were sent in and they spent the next 19 days extensively searching the river. However, they never found anything. There was no body in there. So what initially seemed to be a potentially promising lead actually turned out to be a hoax. The caller was lying. It appears as though this was their idea of some kind of sick prank maybe. You hear of that a lot, don't you, in true crime 
crime cases. Often when there is a tip line, the police will receive false leads because it's someone's idea of a twisted joke. People who do things like that are just horrible, in my opinion. That caller wasted so much police time and resources. The police spent nearly three weeks searching that river for Shelley when they could have been putting that time and effort into other lines of inquiry, all because the call was a hoax. And yeah, as I mentioned before, I don't think the caller was ever identified, as far as I'm aware anyway. However, it wasn't long after this when another lead emerged in the case, a lead that the police very quickly realised wasn't a hoax. You see, just a couple of days after the search of Hannam River was called to an end, on the 14th of October 1984, the police received a report that the body of a woman had been found. The body was found in a wooded area near Watercatch Farm along Long Lane, which is located in Backwell Hill in Bristol, not far from the Bristol Airport. And on the 14th of October, a couple of young children were playing in this wooded area when they discovered the body lying face down on the ground in a copse and the police were informed. When officers arrived at the scene, the area was closed off and immediately I think the detectives had their suspicions that this woman that had been found was probably Shelley Morgan, who had been a missing person for more than four months by this point. But they couldn't confirm this just from looking at the body because the woman, I believe, was actually naked when she was found. She wasn't wearing any clothing apart from some tights which were a bit twisted and had been pulled down to her ankles. So it wasn't like they could identify her through her clothing. And the body was very decomposed. It was clear that this person had been dead for a while because the remains were basically skeletal by this time. So the police had to use dental records in an attempt to confirm her identity and ultimately their theory was proven to be true. The body was that of Shelley Morgan because her dental records matched that of the victim. Following the discovery of her remains, Shelley was sent for a post-mortem which revealed that she had tragically been the victim of foul play. She had been horrifically murdered. It was determined that she had died as the result of being stabbed repeatedly in her back. In total, she had been stabbed 14 times in her back, although no murder weapon was found at the scene. And although I believe this couldn't be 100% confirmed because she was very decomposed, the police do strongly believe that she had been the victim of a sexual assault too, obviously due to the fact that she was practically naked when she was found, apart from her tights, which were around her ankles. And that in itself is very telling. So it seemed more than likely that Shelley had been sexually assaulted and that this crime was sexually motivated. It's thought that Shelley was probably killed on the day that she disappeared and that she had just lay undiscovered in this spot in the wooded area since her death. The clothes that Shelley had been wearing on the day that she vanished were not found alongside her body or anywhere else in the area. So it seemed as though the killer had taken the clothing with them. So they'd taken her glasses and her her long sleeved shirt or dress that she was wearing. Although there were some sandals that were found just dumped in some brambles close to the crime scene. And I believe these sandals were confirmed to have been Shelley's. They were the shoes that she was wearing on the day that she went missing. But apart from these and the tights that she still had on, the rest of her clothing was gone. Also missing were other belongings of Shelley's that she was known to be carrying on the day of her disappearance. So her bag with her sketchbooks in was missing. She also had a letter from her husband in this bag which was missing. None of this was found at the crime scene and nor was her tripod or her camera that she was obviously going to use to take pictures with on the day that she vanished. It was an Olympus OM20 35mm film camera and the serial number on her camera was 1032853. So perhaps the killer kept this camera and the rest of Shelley's belongings as a trope a reminder of what they had done. Or maybe the camera was sold on. It was worth about £130 at the time, so they could have got a fair bit of money from it, but none of these items have ever been located to this day. Now, it was following the discovery of Shelley's body when the police began to wonder whether one of the tips that they had received from a member of the public while Shelley was still a missing person may have been linked to 
to her case after all. If you recall from earlier on in the video, someone came forward saying that they believed that they had seen a woman matching Shelley's description inside of a yellow truck or a yellow lorry in an area in Backwell Hill. And obviously Shelley's body was eventually found in Backwell Hill. So although they couldn't confirm this reported sighting at the time, now it was looking more likely that this probably was actually Shelley that the witness saw. Although having said that, the police have never said exactly where in Backwell Hill this yellow lorry was seen. So we don't know whether it was in an area very close to the crime scene where Shelley's body was or whether it was like at the other end of Backwell. The police theorised that the killer was most likely a local or at least they would have been very familiar with the area to know where they could have hidden Shelley's body. And it's believed that they must have had access to a vehicle to take Shelley to the location where she was found. And they also theorised that the killer may have had connections either through their work or other associations to Backwell where Shelley was left and possibly the Laywoods or Clifton areas of Bristol too where it's believed she went that day. A couple of months after Shelley's body was found in late 1984 her case was featured on an episode of Crime Watch where one of the detectives involved with her case basically did another public appeal. They urged for anyone with any information about Shelley's murder to come forward or anyone with any information regarding her missing belongings to get in touch, in particular the camera. The police were asking people who'd recently acquired an Olympus OM20 camera within the last few months to please check the serial number on the bottom, check if it was Shelley's camera because they were hoping that the killer, whoever they were, had in fact sold her camera and that the person who bought it would get in touch and be able to tell the police who they purchased it from. But unfortunately, as I understand it, nothing really came of this. And as we know, the camera was never found. And sadly, as time went on, the police never really got any closer to tracking down the killer. They just could not identify the man who did this to Shelley. And months without answers turned into years and years and years. Years passed and Shelley's case just remained unsolved. But although no one has yet been definitively linked to the crime, there has been some speculation online as to who the perpetrator might have been. I read on one or two sources that it has been theorised that perhaps Shelley's case could be linked to an unidentified rapist nicknamed the Batman Rapist. The Batman Rapist was a sexual predator who is believed to have committed at least 17 sexual assault attacks on women over a span of about nine years between 1991 to 2000 in Bath, which is a city located in Somerset in the southwest of England. And Bath is only about 12 miles away from Bristol. And the reason the offender was given the nickname the Batman Rapist was because after one of his attacks, he left a baseball cap with the Batman logo on it at the crime scene. And of course, he has never been identified, so we don't know his real name, hence the nickname. The Batman Rapist was considered a suspect in the Melanie Hall case, which I covered quite a few years ago now. She was a young woman who was tragically murdered in Bath, and as of today, her case still remains unsolved. And I'm not entirely sure if the police investigating this case, Shelley's case, ever looked into the possibility that the Batman Rapist could have been Shelley's killer. But as I said, this theory did crop up in my research, so I thought it was worth mentioning. Another potential suspect that has been mentioned in connection with Shelley's case is Christopher Halliwell, who I again made a video about a couple of years ago. If you'd like to watch that video, by the way, I will leave it linked down below, as well as a link to the Melanie Hall video. But Christopher Halliwell was a taxi driver responsible for the murders of two young women, Becky Gordon Edwards, who he killed in 2000 and Sean O'Callaghan who he murdered eight years later in 2011 in Swindon which is a town again in the southwest of England about 40 miles away from Bristol. But although he was convicted of just two murders most people believe that he probably committed more. He may have killed even more women including Shelley Morgan. I believe Halliwell would have been around his early 20s in 1984 when Shelley was murdered so it's definitely possible that he could have been her killer. 
However, again, I don't know if he was ever considered a suspect in the police's eyes. I don't think they've ever come out and named him as a person of interest in Shelley's case. This is, again, just a theory that I came across online. But yeah, as I mentioned before, unfortunately, over the years, Shelley's case just remained unsolved. It essentially went cold, although I don't believe it was ever necessarily classed as a cold case. The case wasn't officially closed, but as does happen over time, less and less tips and leads came in and the investigation into Shelley's murder did begin to take a back seat as other newer cases demanded the police's attention. But then just a couple of years ago, on the 11th of June 2019, so on the 35th anniversary of Shelley's death, the Avon and Somerset police made a renewed appeal for information and they released some new information about some evidence related to the case, information which they had never made public before. They released pictures of two postcards which they believe could be of significance to the investigation. The postcards were tear-off cards from a calendar which were apparently sold by a local charity in Bristol, the Bristol Hospice Charity, and the calendars were believed to have been sold in the 80s when Shelley was killed. And the pictures on these two postcards were of interest to the police because because they are of scenes in Bristol which almost link back to details of Shelley's case, if that makes sense. So one of them is a picture from Bower Ashton in Bristol overlooking the River Avon and just below the Clifton Suspension Bridge. And this links back to Shelley's case because we know that on the day of her disappearance, she did plan on photographing the Clifton Suspension Bridge. And the second postcard is a view of St Andrew's Church in Backwell, which which again links back to Shelley's case because her body was found in an area in Backwell. Now the police haven't said why they're so interested in these postcards and exactly how they have come to be significant in the case. Some people have speculated that perhaps these tear-off postcards were found at the crime scene where Shelley's body was discovered back in October of 1984. But the police have not confirmed this, understandably because the case is still unsolved they do have to keep very tight-lipped about some stuff. They do have to withhold certain information from the public because that information could be vital later on down the line when trying to prove whether or not a suspect could have been the killer. So yeah, they haven't really said much about these postcards, just that they are significant to the investigation. And they have asked for anyone who may have bought the calendar that these postcards were inside of, or anyone who kept the postcards with these specific specific pictures on for some time to get in touch and come forward. So pay close attention to these postcards if you are from the Bristol area or the southwest of England, or if you have family or friends who live in and around Bristol, particularly if they lived in Bristol at the time that this case occurred in the 80s. If you can show them this video or these postcards, then that would be really helpful because who knows, it might spark a memory for someone and they could realise that they have information about the these postcards that might be of interest to the police. In addition to this appeal from the police, Shelley's younger sister Holly also did her own kind of appeal for information on behalf of her and the rest of Shelley's loved ones. 35 years ago, my sister Shelley Morgan was murdered outside of Bristol, England. Her body was left in the woods and wasn't discovered for several months, so we don't know who killed her. She left behind her husband, two small children, one of whom is autistic. Shelley's death had a profound effect on our family and her loss has been felt ever since. For 35 years, I've watched the events of Shelley's life pass by without her. It's been 35 years of silence and the life she didn't get to live. I've come to believe that people aren't really completely dead until they're the people who love and remember them have passed also. As long as we carry Shelley in our hearts, she'll always be with us. But we're all getting older, and the time is come, going to come when all those doors are closed. We beseech you, if you know anything about what happened that day back in June of 1984, please come to the police. Maybe you were afraid to speak out at the time. Maybe, you are, maybe your situation has changed. Out of love and respect for my sister, we really want to know what happened, and be sure that the person who killed her will never hurt anybody ever again. 
Now, some of you may be wondering whether or not there is any DNA evidence in this case, DNA of the killer, and I actually don't know the answer to that question. The police haven't really said much, if anything, about DNA evidence in this case. I mean, obviously, you have to remember that Shelley was killed in the early 80s when DNA and forensic science was in its infancy. And also, as we know, Shelley's body wasn't found for more than four months after her disappearance and death. So her body was very decomposed, she had been exposed to the elements and animals, so chances are any trace of the killer's DNA on her body would have been destroyed in that period of time anyway. Although having said that, I did come across this quote from 2019 from one of the detectives with the Avon and Somerset major crime review team, the team who are currently handling Shelley's case. The detective said, quote, our latest reinvestigation has identified new material of interest which may have forensic potential. Utilising the latest scientific techniques, we're keeping Shelley's family updated on any progress. So that quote seems to suggest that there could be potential forensic evidence or that they're carrying out tests to try and retrieve some DNA evidence. I wonder if perhaps the material of interest that they refer to are the postcards. Perhaps tests were being carried out on the postcards in an attempt to retrieve DNA, but I don't know, that was all the information that I could find regarding that. Sadly, despite the fresh appeal for information in 2019, this case still remains unsolved. But the police still hold out hope that one day they will identify the killer and that Shelley will finally have justice. And I just pray that that day comes soon because next June it will have been four decades since Shelley was murdered and that is just too long to go without answers. Her family deserve to know what happened to Shelley and who took her life that fateful day. They deserve to finally see that evil person face punishment for what they did. My heart goes out to her family, especially her two children. They were so, so young when their mother was killed and I can't imagine how hard it was for them to grow up without her and go all this time not knowing the identity of her killer. And also her husband Nigel, he had to raise their kids on his own following Shelley's death. Nigel has since passed away himself now but sources state that he never remarried and of course he died having never found out who murdered his wife which is just awful. So if anyone watching this video has any information regarding Shelley's case then you can contact the Avon and Somerset major crime review team on 101 or you can contact them through their website which will be linked down below in the description box. Alternatively, if you would like to remain anonymous, you can submit a tip or a lead via Crime Stoppers. You can do this via Crime Stoppers online form or you can call them on 0800 555 111. Again, all of that information will be down below in the description box. And that concludes this case. That is the case of Shelley Morgan. A really, really heartbreaking case. Unsolved cases like this where it's been literally decades and decades since the crime and there are still no answers are just awful. But as I said, the police are still working on this case to this day, so fingers crossed they find the killer soon. As always, do let me know your thoughts on the case in the comments and let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. They can be solved cases, unsolved cases, serial killer cases, you name it. Thank you all so, so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye!